I want to be a boy. And it was completely true. That was what I wanted. And the adult, of course, laughed and kind of tried to explain why that was utterly impossible. And I remember feeling so frustrated that day because I was pretty sure that I was going to grow up to be a boy, or at least I knew that's what I wanted. I just didn't know how to explain it. I didn't have any storyline. I didn't have any narrative. I didn't have any way to say to this adult, no, this is what will happen, or this is why I feel this way. I only had two words, boy and girl, and neither one of them captured what I felt on the inside. I grew up in the uh, 1980s. Um, here I am at six, um, and the 80s had a wonderful wor word, uh, tomboy. Um, and I could turn on the TV and watch Punky Brewster or The Facts of Life. Um, there were lots of spunky girls who liked to wear boys' clothes in the, in the novels that I, that I read, and they were called tomboys. And tomboys were really popular. They were really positive. If I went to uh, my mom's office, um, the women she worked with would, would look at me and smile and they'd say, oh, I was a tomboy when I was your age. It was completely okay. And I loved this word because it let me dress like this. <laughs> it let me wear overalls and have my hair cut short and like climbing trees. It gave me a way to say, I'm not like other girls, to be just a little bit like a boy. So when I think about gender, I think it's can be very confusing, seem like a really broad topic, but if I had to boil it down to just two things, I would say gender is about the words we have, the language we can use to describe ourselves, and it's about clothing and appearance. How do we look, and how does that clothing and that appearance make us feel? What makes us feel good and powerful and right? And for me, this was what felt really good, my tomboy outfits. Um, I think the only downside to the word tomboy for me was that uh, it had a sort of expiration date. Um, at a certain point, I was expected to grow out of it. Uh, the, the, the older women who said they used to be tomboys were not still tomboys <laughs> when they were adults. And I wondered what that would mean. It worried me a great deal. Um, here I am at 10. And again, clothing and, and language. At 10, people are starting to say, you got to grow out of this tomboy thing. And this is school picture day. And I remember having an argument with my mom that morning. She wanted me to dress up. And this was as dressed up as I wanted to be. I was as dressed up as the boys were. It was a collared shirt. And I was like, I look nice. I'm going to wear this. And so, so much of that negotiation of who we are and how we communicate that comes through what we wear, how our hair is styled, and what words we can use to express ourselves. I can remember being maybe a little younger than 10, maybe seven or eight, and going to bed at night and pulling the covers over my head and praying to God to make me a boy. And for reasons that I cannot explain, the God I used to pray to when I was a kid was Zeus. I had been given this great set of comic books about the Greek gods and the, the myths and legends. And I had absorbed from them the fact that Zeus was a really um, convenient God, didn't mind messing around with mortals and had no trouble <laughs> with metamorphosis. So I think I was praying for something about me to change, um, but I, I just didn't know how to enact that change. But change was inevitable. This is me when I'm heading off to boarding school um, in, in ninth grade, and uh, I'd grown my hair out at my mom's insistence, and I had, was wondering now, what do I do? Everyone was telling me I was supposed to be a young woman and a young lady, and I had no more chance to use this word tomboy. I had no understanding of how I might change myself to make what I felt on the inside visible on the outside. I was a jock in high school. That was a useful word. Um, I was also, I came out as a lesbian to my friends. It was another word that in the early 90s seemed to me to be a way to seem not like other girls, to explain why I was more aggressive, more masculine, not interested in dating and boys. All of this was useful, <laughs> um, helpful, but none of it was entirely right. And I can remember in my teen years being really um, uh, sort of despairing that I would ever find the right words to explain who I was. Um, and, and I certainly was always looking for that story that would explain um, how my life would be possible. Oddly enough, the story that I drew the most encouragement from was a story of my ancestor, uh, this woman, Deborah Sampson. So. Uh, if you see the family resemblance between us, um, just keep it to yourself. Um, 
This is a 1790s portrait of, of Deborah, uh, one of the few we have of her. She was born in 1760 um, in the town of Plimpton, Massachusetts, not far from where the pilgrims uh, got off the Mayflower. And she was one of seven children. When she was about four years old, her mother abandoned the family. Uh, sorry, her father abandoned the family, leaving her mother with seven kids to raise on her own, which she absolutely couldn't do. So Deborah was sold um, into indentured servitude, perfectly legal at the time, pretty standard practice for poor families. Um, Deborah was sold to the Thomas family of Middleborough, Massachusetts, and her term of indenture lasted until she was 18 years old. And at 18 years old in the early American Republic, women would have been expected to do one of a couple things. They would have been expected to get married, in which case their husband became their master and had legal rule over them. They would have been expected to sign on to serve a household as Deborah had been doing for her indenture, in which case the man of that household would be her master, or they'd be expected to go home where either a brother or a father could be legally responsible for them. Women in the early American Republic had no legal status of the, their own. They couldn't own property, they couldn't run a business, they couldn't accumulate wealth um, individually. But at 18, Deborah did something totally remarkable. She told the town of Middleborough that she would support herself. Uh, she would become what was called, classed as a masterless woman. Um, they, these were regarded as a very dangerous category. <laughs> uh, you never knew what masterless women would do. And Middleborough, quite surprisingly, allowed her to become a masterless woman, the only one in town, uh, aside from widows who had, whose husbands had died um, and uh, these women were allowed some legal control. But Deborah would have been the only young woman to be masterless. And they let her do that because she could weave. Weaving, sometimes we think of it as a very feminine um, occupation, um, like sewing or spinning, but weaving was slightly different. Weaving was not done at home. It was not a domestic chore. Weaving was actually done at taverns, um, which is kind of odd, you know, just going to go down to the bar and weave for a little bit. Um, but they was done at taverns because looms were huge. They were the size of double beds. Um, and so you had to be very rich to afford one and very, very rich to afford a house big enough to put one in. So you would actually rent a loom in the space at a tavern, set it up there, and weave somebody's wool into, into cloth or weave um, flax into linen. So Deborah wove at Sprout Tavern, which stood on one of Middleborough's greens. And from the doorstep of Sprout Tavern, she said she heard Colonel Ebenezer Sprout himself read the Declaration of Independence just days after it was officially uh, signed. She was there in a, in a tavern, which would have been the male center of life, where news and gossip and weather and crops all was shared in the public rooms. Um, and I think that was probably an instrumental moment in her life, in experiencing what men's lives were like, as opposed to women's lives. Um, when I was researching my novel, Revolutionary, which is based on Deborah's story, um, I went in search of Sprout Tavern um, and drove her all around Middleborough, Massachusetts, this is all that remains of Sprout Tavern. It is the original 1750 outhouse, um, and it is a unique model. It's a three-seater, and one of those seats is child-sized. And I'm just delighted about New England history that someone has bothered to preserve um, this artifact. At any rate, Deborah uh, supported herself uh, on her own for the next couple of years, but then in 1782, General George Washington put out, actually, I think I have one more interesting document. Yes, uh, this is the first record we have of Deborah's existence. Um, so she's over 20 years old uh, when this document records that she joined the Baptist church. Um, and I think this is an important one to share with you, not only because it records just how poor Deborah was, that there was no record of her existing up until this point, but also to point out how, how rebellious she was. The Baptist church was brand new, and it was egalitarian. Um, she was leaving the Congregationalist church, uh, which 99% of the town would have belonged to. So she was really striking out independently. Anyway, in 1782, not long after she joins this congregation, General George Washington uh, puts out a call for recruits. Um, it will be the final call of the American Revolutionary War. And all across the state of Massachusetts, nobody wants to sign on to fight. The war has been going on for years and years now. Um, most men have already served. 
And so for the first time, towns across Massachusetts have to offer a bounty. They have to pay a reward for men to sign on. And in the spring of that year, Deborah sat at her loom in Sprout Tavern and watched as the bounty got higher and higher until it reached 20 pounds silver for any man who would sign on. That must have been an irresistible fortune. So Deborah hatched a plot with a fellow servant um, and she went to the servant's household. Uh, they stole a set of men's clothes or borrowed, I should say, a set of men's clothes. Deborah tucked her hair under a cap, walked down to the local law office where recruits were signing on, signed the name Timothy Thayer, collected the bounty and went back home. In short order, someone had perceived that she had uh, a disguise on and reported her to the local authorities. Um, and they told Deborah, as soon as we can find the constable, we're going to arrest you. Deborah was not one to wait around, so she ducked out the back door before the constable could find her, stole a different set of men's clothes, and went uh, throughout the state of Massachusetts looking for a place to sign on. We have an interesting record of this fact. Uh, this also comes from the Baptist Church in 1782, and they're writing about the case of Deborah Sampson. If you have a hard time reading it, I will just read it for you. It says, we considered the case of Deborah Sampson, a member of this church who last spring was accused of dressing in men's clothes and enlisting as a soldier in the army. And although she was not convicted, yet was strongly suspected of being guilty and for some time before behaved very loose and unchristian-like. So this, I think, tells a lot about Deborah as well. Uh, the, the phrase very loose and unchristian-like, that as a woman, an independent, perhaps uh, rebellious woman who wanted to be with or be like men, she would be viewed as unchristian-like. In fact, her actions in dressing as a man were a crime. The, and she, she could have been arrested, not that she tried to steal bounty money, but she could have been arrested merely for wearing men's clothes. Um, so she fled town and she was not arrested. And uh, she went all over Massachusetts. Here's where she starts in Middleborough. She goes down to what's now New Bedford, thinks about signing on to a boat, goes up to Boston, thinks about signing on here, and then begins to go from town to town using the name Robert Shirtliff asking how much are you paying for recruits? She gets to Bellingham and Uxbridge, signs on as Robert Shirtliff, and they say, meet us in Worcester. And when she goes up to Worcester, she joins a company of raw recruits and they march all the way to West Point. Can you imagine being a 22 year old impoverished young woman, abruptly finding yourself in company of 50 men with a chance to start your life over? It must've been exhilarating. It must have been terrifying. And what happens next was even more remarkable, a story that I just so enjoyed learning about as a little kid and even more when I learned it again as an adult. She gets to West Point and she's picked for the light infantry. Uh, this is a typical infantry man's uh, uniform. Um, and she's, she is given a lot of, of equipment and gear, a big musket. You had to be pretty tall and strong to draw your ramrod and load your musket. Um, and she's given this one uniform. Uh, and I think one of the keys to Deborah being able to live as a man successfully in the army is that they did just get one uniform. And she reports that in the, in the year and a half that she was in the army, they were forced to bathe upon two or three occasions. And she managed to avoid uh, bathing at those times. Uh, so it's, uh, there was not a culture of taking one's clothes off or being um, even stripped down a little bit. Uh, they wore these uniforms all the time. So Deborah was in the infantry and she served for a year and a half. Uh, the war was almost over. The British held Manhattan, um, but Deborah was active in the Hudson Valley, um, going up and down the Hudson River, looking for British uh, raiders. Uh, there were a lot of loyalists still in the area, some of whom had hired basically private armies or mercenaries to protect crops. And Deborah was active. She was wounded um, in a skirmish. Um, she uh, was active near Peekskill and Terrytown, and you can go and see some of the camps she was in. And then she spent the winter at New Windsor. This was the final cantonment, and Washington or was, was nearby in Newburgh and ordered all the troops to build these huts. Um, they originally would have had two fireplaces, one on each end, two chimneys. And Deborah spent three or four months of winter in a hut just like this one, 
with 16 other men, triple decker bunks. And when I saw this cabin and when I walked around inside, I often had heard Deborah described as someone who disguised herself as a man. I don't think she did. I think she lived as a man. I think at some point, Deborah became Bob, became Robert Shirtliff, and lived life as a man. And I think that because of just how tight these quarters were and how impossible it is to constantly hold in your mind that duality, that I am both a man and a woman, I am disguising who I truly am. I think she was that person. And that so resonated with me when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. This story of a woman long ago in very different and very much more difficult circumstances who just said, I'm going to go and be this person. I want to be free. And that deeply resonated with me. I felt almost imprisoned within this expectation of being a woman. So when I was 16 years old, 17 years old, um, I was in Boston for the summer in between my junior and senior year of high school. And I went to a youth group that was designed for gay and lesbian youth. I'd come out as a lesbian and I wanted to uh, meet some other people like me. And it was at that group for the first time in my life that I heard the word transgender. It was a brand new word in the 90s. And the people who sat in front of me and explained that they were transgender told stories that resonated so deeply with me that they'd been born as boys, but always thought they were girls. And now they wanted to live their life in that gender. And I thought, I feel the same way. And it wasn't long after that, that I came out and it had what we would now call a social transition. I cut my hair short, I changed my name to Alex. And here I am back at my prep school for my senior year, wearing boys dress code, a coat and tie. I was absolutely ecstatic. It was a difficult year, um, a lot of challenges as I tried to explain to my parents, to my whole family, to my friends, to my teachers, uh, what it was that I wanted, but it was also utterly wonderful. For the first time in my life, I was able to be true, be honest, to feel that I was being seen as who I was. Um, Again, it wasn't all easy, but Deborah's story really helped me. Um, she didn't have words like transgender. She didn't have concepts uh, around gender like we have today that would have helped her explain what she really felt. And in fact, in her own life, she was forced to return to living as a woman. This is a statue of her uh, that stands in front of the Sharon Public Library. At the end of the war, Washington decommissioned and degarrisoned all of the standing army. And he specifically said that the troops were to be sent home to their mother's care. <laughs> he was very afraid of mutiny, and he thought the moms could control the soldiers. Deborah had no contact with her mother. You'll recall that she was sold into indentured servitude. But she did have an aunt, and she went back to that aunt. Only she told that aunt that she was Ephraim Sampson, her brother. And for the next few months, she lived with her aunt as Ephraim. Unfortunately, the real Ephraim Sampson was living two towns over, and eventually people figured out that one of them was not the real Ephraim, and Deborah had to give up this identity. Once again, she was threatened with legal action, and she was forced to resume life as a woman. She eventually married. She had children. Um, she did one more remarkable thing. She became America's first traveling woman lecturer, and she went all around New England and upstate New York and she would put on her dress, get up on stage, give a talk about being a wife and a mother and a woman, about being a patriot and having served her nation. And then she'd go backstage, put on her old uniform, get her musket and go through this, the manual exercise of arms, the military drill right there on stage. And when I learned this fact about her, it made so much sense. I think Deborah was intensely proud of who she was and she too was looking for a way to explain what she knew to be true, that she was as capable as any man, perhaps understood herself in some way to be a man, to wanted to show that even though society forced her to be a woman, she was in many ways still a soldier. And that resonated so deeply with me. Um, I drew tremendous uh, courage from her story and inspiration. And I'll share just one last uh, tale with you. Um, when I came out as transgender and changed my name to Alex, 
I was 17 and I had to wait a little over a year until I was old enough to legally change my name in the state of Maine. And to do that in Maine, um, you go to probate court. And my father, who's a lawyer, assured me, oh, probate court is no big deal. You fill in the paperwork. Maybe you talk to the judge for a little bit, but generally they just sign off, change your names. They do 20 of them a day. No big deal. So I went to probate court um, in Paris, Maine. And the judge gave me one look and he said, are you here to change your name or are you here to change your sex? And I said, oh, uh, I'm here for a name change. Um, and he said, well, I think you're in violation of the law. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, Your Honor. He said, uh, the state of Maine has a law against male impersonation. No woman can go around saying she's a man. For that reason, I'm not gonna grant you your change of name. This was the start of a long conversation, not entirely a pleasant one. I eventually said, look, I'm changing my name to Alex, not Alexander. Alex is a gender neutral name. You really have no basis. It's no business of yours how I look, just wanting to change my name. And after a lot of back and forth, he eventually agreed. I was stunned in 1996 that it was still on the books that a woman could not dress as a man, that this was still considered a crime. That was the same law that Deborah Sampson had been arrested under when she first tried to enlist. And in fact, the state of Maine and the state of Massachusetts kept those laws on their books until 2006, if you can believe that. And I really pause and think about that um, when I wonder about all the laws we hear about now around transgender people and the great stake that so many legislators um, and judges uh, seem to have in policing, controlling, and defining people's gender and no, quote unquote knowing what a person really is. Uh, this is a practice that obviously goes back to colonial era and even before that. So knowing that story of Deborah's from the 1700s gave me tremendous courage in the 1990s to come out, uh, to speak the truth of who I was. Um, and it's often inspired me since then, not only to write this novel, but to carry forward what sometimes can be a very frustrating uh, set of tasks as I advocate for transgender inclusion, as I work with schools to help support transgender students, um, and as I just lead my own life as a transgender person. So I'll stop here and see if anyone has any questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself um, or you can raise your hand or you can write it in the chat if you don't want to unmute yourself or ask a question. Kevin, I see that you have a question. I have a question. Um, please understand that I'm a bit older than most people and this subject is a bit awkward for me. But is there anything different about you genetically? What, what, what about you made you want to be a boy instead of a girl? Yeah, um, so that is an interesting question and I wish I had a good answer. Um, there's not a lot we know about the genetics of being transgender or the genetics of being gay or lesbian. There have been a lot of studies. Um, most of them have not recorded any results. Um, the way I knew I was a boy is the same way everyone else knows. I just felt that way. <laughs> um, and it was regardless of what people said to me. And it was regardless of people trying to say, but look at your body. And I'd say, I'm, I'm looking at it and I still think I'm a boy. Um, and the fact that I've never had surgery, but I've lived most of my life as a man makes me say that biological sex, my chromosomes, my, my genitalia, my physical presence has nothing to do with my gender. Gender's all in the mind. Gender's all in the mind and gender's expressed on the outside. So I knew psychologically, emotionally, mentally, that I was a boy, no matter what my body was supposed to be telling me. And I remain biologically female. I take testosterone. I've taken testosterone since my mid twenties, um, but chromosomally, again, all the rest of my body, female, but I live as a man. 
it makes sense to me. <laughs> um, and, and I, but I know it's baffling to people who have been told their whole lives, you're a boy because you have uh, this body. But to me, it's a question of mind versus body. Thank you. Sure. Then Amber, I saw your hand raised if you wanted to unmute yourself. You are me, you're, okay, there you go. I got it. I enjoyed your story so much. And you talked about working with trans youth and advocating. And I'm curious, we had a lot of opposition in this town when it came to a school policy to protect um, trans and non-conforming youth. So what other things can we as a town or community do to be more inclusive and provide a safe space um, for trans youth? And how do we overcome? I mean, that's kind of a loaded question, I think, but the opposition, what are some things sure. that maybe you've had success with? Yeah, um, this is work I've done uh, across New Hampshire and around the world. Um, and, and it's different for every place because the, the, the hurdles or the concerns can be different. So um, I, I'm loath to say that one size fits all, but often what I like to talk about is take the pressure off transgender and non-binary people. And let's just talk about gender. Everybody has gender. <laughs> um, and, and how, so when I go to a school, I'm just as curious, how does it feel to be a girl at this school as I am, how does it feel to be transgender at this school? And so encouraging schools to acknowledge gender and to talk about it is often a great first step. Um, encouraging places that are very gender segregated to talk about what good things and what bad things happen in those single gender spaces. So for instance, when I go to a school, they'll often say something like, we could never, never do anything with our locker rooms, right? Boys and girls have to be separate. And I'll say, okay, tell me the top 10 great things that happen in your boys' locker room. Okay, tell me a couple bad things that happen in your boys' locker room. Oh, well, there's this and, this. and I'm like, oh, so it's a place that has problems. Let's talk about how to fix those problems. And sometimes in, in, the, in that conversation, what comes out is when you put boys together and say it's all boys here, there's some problems that, that, that occur. Sometimes bullying, sometimes really negative language, sometimes some misogyny. Um, and what, do we, what can we do to change that dynamic. So that, that can be one path. And then other times there's such resistance to talking about these things that you kind of have to go a different route. Um, and I did a lot of work in New Hampshire with schools around bathrooms. Um, and they almost never want to let transgender girls into girls' restrooms. That's kind of the big culture war at the moment. But they mostly will, will send them to single stall restrooms. And usually there's only a couple of these in a school, maybe in the principal's office, maybe in the nurse's office. And it's really isolating and inconvenient um, and sometimes unhealthy for the kid to, to use that bathroom space. But if that's what the school is gonna allow, then the best I can push for is to say, what's the sign on that bathroom door? And can it say something that affirms the people who use it? Can it say, instead of restroom, all gender restroom? Right, we, we put like family restroom on it. Um, but can we at least acknowledge that there are transgender and non-binary students in this school and that they deserve to be recognized, that there are people who aren't girls or boys. Um, and, and can we somehow have some language, some presence for those people? It's a very, very small victory that sometimes actually feels like a loss, but you get one sign and you start to raise awareness. Um, so again, you kind of have to look for the right avenue to approach. Um, but those are places where I've started. But Alex, why does it have to say anything other than restroom? Because men can use it, women can use it, transgender people can use it. Why does it have to say anything other than restroom? Sure, um, but boys and girls are mentioned all over the place. Where's a non-binary person supposed to go? And if we're, if we're willing, well, then all of them should say bathroom. <laughs> if we're willing to name boys and girls, we should be willing to name non-binary people. You, if you want to say restroom, then that's great. Put underneath it, um, boys, girls, non-binary people, people of all genders are welcome to use this restroom. The thing is, is if you don't name it, then they're invisible. 
then you, then the school is only operating as if boys and girls exist. And they're saying, we don't really notice, see, care about, or protect anyone else, just boys and girls. I disagree. Mm -hmm. that, that is absolutely fine. That is completely your right. Um, I just, I, I, and, I've worked. And I, I admit, I don't have your experience. So I'm disagreeing from, from my own values, but, but thank you. Sure. And then I had a question from Betty Connors as well. If you wanted to unmute yourself. Hi, it's actually uh, Debbie and Betty. Okay, Debbie, Debbie and Betty, okay. That's okay. Um, I had a question, Alex. I noticed when we go out um, into restaurants now, it's, it's like pops out more than ever that they have like, they have the Phillies and the fellas or <laughs> all these cute names, but it's, boys you know, and girls. boys and gulls. And, you know, it's um, as uh, my wife, Betty is very butch and ha her whole life, uh, you, when we first met 20 years ago, she told me that she always had problems with bathrooms and, um, <laughs> You know, and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Until we were at a place in Dover and I actually heard a woman come running out of the bathroom screaming, there's a man in there, there's a man in there. <laughs> and here comes Betty walking out saying, I told you. And so I'm wondering what, what do you feel the same way when you go into a bathroom or a, in a restaurant and see that? Yeah, um, and, and again, that happens all the, the time. And I'm sort of like, where, where do you want people to go, right? Um, when I talk about bathroom usage, I always say what I'm interested in is that you go to use the bathroom, you don't make a mess, you wash your hands afterwards and you leave, yep. right? Um, but yep. that of course is, is not what people seem to think happens in, in restrooms. Um, so, the, the, and the bathroom bills, are, they're like the laws around that people are passing right now around uh, transgender girls and athletics. Um, there's not a problem, right? We're not seeing massive numbers of, of arrests of transgender women who are harassing people in bathrooms. In fact, we haven't seen any. Um, so, so we're not solving a problem, we're creating one. And I always say, you know, who's, who's checking, right? Um, we should absolutely uh, robustly talk about behavior in bathrooms, right? If someone has a phone out and is taking a video of you, that's a problem, right? Someone's calling you names, that's a problem. But you just go in and do your business, wash your hands afterwards, we're good. Um, don't, you know, doesn't, we don't need to check IDs. Um, and again, I go back to my own experience. As I say, um, I've lived as a man for most of my life. I remain 90% biologically female. If I walk into a woman's restroom, someone's going to scream, right? So I go to the men's room. No one screams. Um, no one's checking my ID at the door either. Um, and if they did, I don't think they'd be comfortable knowing where to send me. There's, there's lots of people who, for lots of reasons, don't fit neatly into those two boxes. Um, and I, again, who, who is to say who we are? Thank you. I had a question for you. Sure. Um, if you had the choice to change your gender um, earlier on in childhood, would you have? Yeah, I actually asked my mom that not too long ago. Uh, we were watching some TV show about transgender kids and she said, oh, they're just so young. <laughs> and I said, mom, when I was their age, what kind of things did, did I like to do? And she's like, oh, you were such a tomboy. I said, right, I was, I was such a tomboy. If we, if you were, if, if you were doing that again, like right now and knew what you know about gender, um, would, what would you have done? She's like, oh, you know, probably would have clicked that word and you, like I probably would have made the association. There's a lot more awareness around it. And I think there's a lot more possibility to be affirmed. Um, I don't know that I would have wanted to, you know, come out or transition um, back then. But what I would have loved is somebody saying, oh, if you want to be a boy, you can be a boy instead of laughing at me um, or instead of trying to make me more feminine in order to kind of push me away from boyish things. I think that was what was really difficult as a kid was when people would say to me, um, stop acting like a boy 
go put on a dress as if that was going to solve a problem, right? Um, just to have anybody say to me, hey, it's fine. You want to cut your hair short? No big deal. It was just a gender was a constant battle. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, I work with, with uh, parents and teachers and they'll, they'll say about a five-year-old, how can they possibly know who they are? And I'm like, Probably no five-year-old knows who they are on any score, but ask them what makes them feel good. And then ask them, what's the cost of letting them do that, right? If, if the little boy wants to wear a dress and he says, it makes me feel amazing. It makes me feel like I can fly. Okay, put on a dress. Who's hurt by that, right? Um, so that, that's what I would have wanted as a kid. Betty, did you guys have a question again? Your hand Thank is raised. You. You're muted, so I'm not sure if you do. <laughs> I just didn't know how to un to take it down. Okay, so it's on the reactions, and then you can hit lower hand. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. You're all set. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or anything? Think, oh, okay, Kevin, you do have another question. And you can you can unmute yourself, Kevin. Alex, I have to give you a lot of credit. For me, again, as an, as an older person, uh, this, this is somewhat more enlightening than I had expected. Um, it gives me pause for thought. I don't know whether it's possible, but at some point in time, I think I'd like to continue this conversation with you at your convenience. And it might not be possible because we both live different lives and we're on different schedules. But um, if you're willing to share your contact information with, through the library, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. I always, I always love having conversations, um, even when they're difficult. <laughs> Sometimes, especially <laughs> then. So, yep, happy to uh, to share that. I also have a website, and you can contact me through that. I no, promise no, no. I will not make it difficult. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I do have a question from I think it's. Jonna, or maybe Joanna, um, she said that her mic is broken, um, but her 21 year old trans son knew when he was a child, he wanted to be a boy. And she said, I wish we knew then what we know now, we would have let him be himself and we would have figured out, uh, would have allowed him to be on puberty blockers until he figured it out. Yeah, Thank puberty you. blockers are amazing. Um, they're, they're sort of a, a lifeline for both um, transgender kids, questioning kids and their parents. Um, for those of you who don't know that, um, it's a relatively recently developed class of drug that just delays puberty. Um, and so if a kid is, let's say, 10 years old and is really questioning their gender, um, but they're not sure or their parents aren't sure, um, they can just sort of pause um, physical development, um, hormonal development, but psychological and emotional development continues. And what you end up getting is you get a kid who's maybe 16 or 17, a lot more emotionally secure, a lot more psychologically and intellectually developed. Um, and they haven't gone through what for a transgender person is a truly traumatizing experience often of having a body become um, really foreign, really um, at odds with, with who they are. So it, it's not all, all trans people feel that way, but for some trans people, that's a really, really powerful option to have. And did anyone else have any questions or anything? I don't wanna skip anybody. If you do, you can ask it in the chat. You can raise your hand. You can unmute yourself. I had a, a follow-up question to um, For the puberty blockers, um, I can I can absolutely understand how it would be devastating for a child who's questioning to go through puberty if, if they just don't know. Um, but would you not say that would be equally hard for a child that they're not maturing in in either direction, whether girl or boy of what they're questioning to be or not, because yeah. When, when I was in seventh grade and my body didn't look like, um, you know, the rest of the girls, <laughs> that, that was pretty hard. And it, you know, I would, I was just curious. 
I've, I have yet to meet the person who was like, puberty was the best time of my life, right? Um, so that doesn't exist. Um, but uh, yeah, you have, to, you have to help kids learn to talk about that. And again, I view this, it's not just for trans kids, it's for everybody. You know, I, I run a, a boys dorm in a high school and I've got ninth grade boys who are six feet tall and, you know, linebackers. And I've got ninth grade boys who look like they're about 10 years old. And I have to teach them how to live with themselves and live with each other. And that they're, they're both still 14 year old boys, right? Um, so a lot of, of, I think, in helping adolescents negotiate puberty is teaching them to talk and think positively about who they are, allowing them to imagine what they want to be through a period of, of great mental and emotional uncertainty. And that's true if, if the kid is straight, if the kid is transgender, if the kid is a lesbian, it, their body and their mind are, are, are changing. And so no, the, the, you know, kids don't develop at the same rate, at least when you're on puberty blockers, you know why. <laughs> um, I think I meet a lot of girls and boys who don't develop at the same rate as their peers and they wonder what's wrong with me, right? So at least there's that sort of like, I'm doing this for a reason. And yeah. Kevin and Pam, did you guys have a question again? It's me this time. Okay. I always am. Um, when, if somebody feels that that medication that you just said um, would be a, a logical step, wouldn't it be also logical to make sure that the parents have an outlet to talk and how to steer those conversations? I mean, just giving a child a drug and not having the, the guidance and the conversation, especially since this is Brave New Worlds, um, it seems like that would only be half of a trip, half a journey. You are in line with every medical professional I've ever met. That is exactly what happens. Um, usually both the child and the parent um, have counseling um, and the physician who prescribes it um, is often required to have proof of that before they'll prescribe. Um, and that's true throughout a transgender person's life. Um, there's a medical diagnosis that goes with many kinds of uh, hormone therapy. Um, it's called gender dysphoria. And to get those drugs prescribed, you need to see um, a therapist or a psychologist and, and you need to be in counseling. Again, I would argue that most people I meet would do well to see a counselor. <laughs> I don't think it's unique to, to trans or, or, um, or non-binary people, but it's so helpful to have someone who knows more than you do and who has been down this road before. Because sometimes, again, I'll work with transgender adolescents and they're like, I just want to change my body right now, right now, I can't wait, I can't wait. And, and a counselor can be like, deep breath, what do you expect out of this? How are you feeling? And they, they'll handle the anxiety as well as the, the, the gender piece. And those two are not the same thing, um, but it all gets wrapped up together. So it's super important to talk to someone who, who has that expertise and it's almost always required. Wouldn't the parents also be saying, I don't know how to deal with this anxiety? <laughs> yes, they are. Um, and, and they have their own concerns and they have their own process. So, you know, yeah. a kid may well have been feeling this and thinking this for years, but it can be very surprising to the parent so they're on a different timeline. They had expectations. They thought my daughter's gonna get married um, and their daughter is thinking, I'm gonna be a boy. And, and so they have these different outcomes. So they can do counseling as a family, but there's also really good resources um, just for the parents. They might need to process separate from their child for sure. Okay, thanks, that makes yeah. sense. Are there any other questions? Bless Anyone? Yes. Okay. She, uh, Joanna, I think, or, jo or jo I don't know. I'm going to butcher your name and I'm really sorry. And she said, yes, we have joined my son's counseling, even though he is an adult. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. There's also a wonderful, um, group nationwide called P flag, and it stands for parents and friends of lesbians and gays. And, um, it's, it's such a wonderful support. Um, it's a, it's, it's really kind of a peer counseling group. And it's a place where parents can go when their kids come out or kid comes out 
and, and be with other adults who have had that experience. Um, and many of them go there in a sort of crisis moment. Like, I, I, I don't want this to happen. I'm embarrassed that it happened. I don't know how to handle it. And then they stay for like 20 years and, and they become the sort of proud and supportive mom or dad. So I, I, I would highly recommend that group as well. And there's always books at the library that yes. speak. <laughs> and let me just plug that. That speak from these experiences and people that, you know, grew up wanting to change their gender and being able to do that, or maybe not being able to do that until later on. And it's, there's always resources available and, you know, there's, there's something out there for everybody to find the answer that they need. <laughs> Spoken like a librarian. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm good at. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. Does anyone have any other questions? I don't want to not let somebody ask a question that they might want to ask or anything. I'm not seeing any hands raised. You can unmute yourself if you don't know how to raise your hand. That's OK, too. Or if you're on video, you can wave, and I'll try to find you. Um, or shoot the library an email after, and we can ask Alex that question later on. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us tonight. And James is needs to ask a question. Who does? James Rollins. Okay, so I will. If you James, unmute yourself, you are unmute. You are muted. So on the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the microphone. If you hit that, you will unmute yourself. the the uh, am i unmuted now you are unmuted oh what what do you think about the um trans woman playing women's sports either at the uh, high school level or older yeah that is getting a lot of national coverage um it's a really interesting question. Um, there's, there is little doubt that testosterone gives athletic advantage in some sports. For instance, uh, weightlifting and short distance track, like we're under, under the 800, a, a, a substantial advantage. I'm not convinced that taking lots of testosterone makes you better at volleyball or gymnastics. <laughs> um, there's, in other words, it's not so cut and dry as people are like, well, if you have testosterone, you're going to beat women of all the sports. It's like, well, there's more to it than that. Um, so that's one thing I think. I also um, look around nationally and I don't see a lot of transgender girls dominating women's sports. In fact, I don't see a lot of transgender girls on athletic teams. Um, I've, I've worked with um, dozens and dozens and dozens of schools um, and I can count on one hand the number of trans girls on sports teams that I've worked with. Um, there's one case nationally in Connecticut um, where two transgender girls ran track um, for their high school teams, and they sometimes won state championships. And I think that fact is really telling. They sometimes won. They didn't dominate, they didn't win every year, and they sometimes lost. In other words, they were pretty good competitors to the girls that they raced against. Um, and, and, and again, um, I think that's fine and that's fair. Um, the way that the transgender girls have generally been treated if they're not allowed to play on a girls team is they're not allowed to play sports at all. Um, most of them are not gonna be competitive on boys teams. Um, and again, when I, I'm a coach, I coach ice hockey, I coach cross country. Um, the purpose of, of high school athletics in most cases um, is to teach teamwork, um, is to get some exercise. It's very rare that it, that it's more than that. Um, there's occasionally an exceptional athlete who's going to use it in their college process. Um, so I generally see the benefit being, um, towards more inclusivity. Um, if you want to make a case in the NCAA or the Olympics, that there should be different standards, I'm all ears for hearing what that standard would be. Um, but, uh, in high school athletics, I, I, a, I don't see it being actually a problem. It's kind of made up. And B, um, I don't see the, the role of high school athletics for most athletes as being uh, problematic to including transgender girls. Thank you. Sure. 
And do we have any other questions? Anything anybody would like to ask? I have a question. Yes, Marsha. Um, Alex, you chose not to do surgery or much surgery, apparently. You said you're still 90% um, a female body. Yep. Um, if you were younger, would you have thought differently, perhaps? Or Because I know a couple of transgender people who have had surgery, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, pros and cons on that. Yeah, I think it's a very um, individual choice. Um, and it kind of depends how you feel about and relate to your body. I know transgender people who, who feel very much like their body is not their own until they have surgery. Um, I know transgender people who feel like they'd like to have surgery, but it's too expensive. Um, and I also know transgender people who feel um, more similar to me, which is I live my life every day as a guy very few people challenge or question me on that unless I choose to be out. And that's what I want. I want to move through the world being seen as a man and who I am under my clothes is not, doesn't matter to me. That it's not what makes me feel or not feel like a, like a boy. Um, but I, I, there's a full range of, of, of feelings and expressions around that. Um, and it's hard to say what's, what's typical. Um, it's going to change a lot for, for each person. Okay, thank you. Sure. And I'm gonna say your name wrong again. Jo, jo I don't know, Joanna. Jana. Jana, Jana uh, said, uh, my son was very dysphoric. He had top surgery and made a huge difference. Yeah, and so that I would say, I've, I've heard that from a lot of transgender people. If they want surgery, after they have it, they generally feel a greater sense of unity and wholeness and goodness about their bodies. Um, it can be very, that's why it's often called gender affirming. It just feels like, oh, this is what I was meant to be. Um, but again, sometimes I worry that that's, that narrative dominates. Um, it's true for a lot of transgender people, but it's not true for all. Um, so it's important to share that story. And it's also important to say, and if you don't want surgery, that doesn't mean there's, that you're not trans, right? Or not trans enough, um, which I'll sometimes hear people say, I don't want surgery, so I must not be trans. I'm like, well, it's okay. <laughs> Do your own thing. I heard a thing that was like trans people aren't a monolith they're all still people and yeah. all of them have different stories and different feelings similar to how all you know all people are not just the same there's they have different ex expectations in their lives and different ways they want to live and you absolutely their journey is their journey and whatever makes them happy and healthy I don't, I don't want to stop anyone from asking questions. <laughs> I feel bad. Does anyone else have anything that they'd like to add? Any questions? Well, um, I like to say thank you to Kaylee. She officially had her last day on Friday. And so this is um, the type of person she is that has gone above and beyond to still host this phenomenal program. We were going to do this program no matter what. <laughs> And so thank you, Kaylee, um, for really serving our community. Education is everything. Um, the hard and the easy, right? And uh, this is obviously a sensitive topic. And um, I think it was wonderful. I think, um, Kevin, I, I love to, to, to say that, you know, you, you said, I'm leaving here with some food for thought, which is fantastic. And I love that. Um, I do not want to keep anyone from their, from maybe their late dinner or the rest of their evening. But um, as a new assistant director, I would love to hear from you. If I like to know what type of programs you want to see in the near future, you don't have to tell me now, but you can um, either stop in and say hello or send me an email. I am highly available all the time <laughs> um so so thank you and alex fantastic thank you so much thank you for coming back a year later after we had scheduled it i yes. appreciate it so much a, a pleasure and really um if anyone has additional questions or thoughts please reach out um always happy to to chat more it's been um it's been nice to meet you all on zoom maybe someday in person <laughs> thank you everyone thank Bye. you alex thank you.